You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I am going solo today, and we have a special guest, Chris Arvin, who just cashed a massive check this year on uh, on the first tournament of the year, I believe with the big pool bass masters uh he was fishing out of dam five on the upper potomac river and we're just going to kind of like give him a moment to to actually hype up his success this is going to be one of many wins i bet in his future so chris how you doing today i'm wonderful today i don't know how massive that check was it paid for gas <laughs> <laughs> dude a w is a w and to win the first tournament of the year that's the big it's got to be like a good juju thing just to feel like get things rolling takes a lot of stress off your shoulders. Except so last year, I mean, it's like, I don't know. I don't know how many times I came in top five, but just mm-hmm. couldn't. And then to go out and win the first one this year, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where you're like, all right, maybe I can do this. Mm-hmm. Is that the first one that you've won in a while on the Upper Potomac? Yeah. You know, that, that, honestly, it's the first one ever. Really? I've only been tournament fishing. So I started fishing club tournaments in high school uh, about 2013 and then once i joined the military that kind of it seemed like every drill weekend was a tournament weekend so the only tournaments i was fishing were like three and a half hour thursday night like shootout style tournaments and i know one year we came in second place like four or five times and we just couldn't we would either lose the fish that we needed or we just couldn't get a fifth bite or something something would always happen but to go out and just win the first one just to uh, it's I, I feel zero stress the rest of the year because of it mm-hmm. so i mean like yeah honestly dude the floor is yours just kind of like walk us through it so it was um based on um my notes here it was february 27th it was last sunday in in february so it was a lot colder kind of just walk us through the day um like what was it like oh yeah so when we got to the boat ramp uh we didn't think we were going to be able to fish because uh <laughs> my buddy's dash on his nitro was froze shut so we couldn't get the plug out to put in the boat so oh. I, t- I put hot hands in my hand and held them over the like where the key push button thing goes in mm-hmm. just put body heat and that extra heat on it to finally get it to where we could get the plug out oh my god then <laughs> we finally get the launch and we're sitting out there and the river was rolling i think it was up uh, it was it peaked at like seven feet which if anybody knows the the upper potomac four feet is is like ideal between three and four you're in the money but seven feet is like twice normal pool so the water was rolling it was high it was muddy but when we got there i don't know i still don't know what they were i'm assuming they were carp were coming up and like feeding on mayflies or something off the top of the water it was like 20 some degrees when we got there water temperature i think got up to like 41 and a half that day so it was extremely cold dirty water fast water everything you don't want in a small mouth fishing tournament mm-hmm. and uh we just went out and we <laughs> we fished the spot that's won the tournament three years in a row and uh they were there again now did you camp or was there a lot of running and gunning or, or how oh, did that go down all day long we were on a f- probably 50 yard stretch for eight hours which wow. is a ridiculous day and it's boring but if you know they're there there's no reason to leave so then when did, when did you start getting bit? Like, was it like right away? Did it take time? Was it a grind for each bite? It was, uh, it was pretty, I think like probably a half hour in, we got our first bite and I ended up losing it. Oh gosh. Or maybe, start. yeah, I lost one and then my buddy broke off one and that's how the day started. But oh my God. Broke that second one off, I hooked up on like a, I think it was like a 1.83 because I bought that new Rapala scale that keeps track of your best five. Mm-hmm. So. That was like our small one of the day. And then after that, he retied and um, he ended up catching one that was like three five or three eight, something like that. And then I caught another one that was over three. And then we ended up like kind of hitting like a lull. And so know. by like by like noon, where are you at? Uh, by noon, we had 13, was it 1305? Okay. So wow. we, we basically, I mean, up there, like we knew, like, all right, we got a good bag. Maybe if we can call this one eight out, we'll have a better shot at it. We at least knew we were going to be like top five, but we didn't 
you know, because when you're catching them, I'm just assuming everybody else is catching them. Yeah. And uh, I think at like 1.30 that afternoon, I called out the 1.8 for like a 1.9. It was almost two pounds. So, I mean, we upgraded by a couple ounces. I think we ended up weighing in 13.8. So we had almost 14 pounds. So did, did you did you catch all your fish in like a flurry of like an hour or two? You said you pretty much had 13 pounds by noon. So like what was your, what was your bite window, I guess? Yeah, from like 8 to like 11. Okay. That, that was really it. And I think we only got one other bite after that. Okay. And what made you want to stay then? Like a, a, after, let's say you catch 13 pounds and you, you beat the shit out of this one spot. Like what mentally, I guess, I guess going from the mental tactic side of things, what at that point you got 13 and based on what you said, 13 is pretty damn good for the river. Mm -hmm. What makes you say like, you know what, we're going to finish out here versus like, let's run and gun and try to find somewhere else. With the water being so high, there's not many eddies on that stretch of river. It's, it's pretty channelized. So every other place that we could think of, that water was rolling. And mm. it was, uh, my buddy's got an 80-pound Minkota Tarova on his boat, and we had it on 10, and we're not moving. I mean, we're literally locked in place. But the spot that we were in, once the water gets that high, there's some, like, really good boulders and stuff there. It's on a turn in the river, and it's on the wide side of the river, so it's a little bit deeper. It's close to deep water. There was just it, – it's the right concoction when the water's high. And that's just him fishing that section of river for 20, 30 plus years and knowing that they're there. Like we're getting bites. We know there's fish here. We we can't leave it because as soon as we do somebody, we had probably uh, one, two, four boats within 300 yards, like a three radius. So we knew as soon as we left that spot, somebody else was sitting right in it. So we kind of couldn't, it was more or less we were playing defense mm, because okay. what, what are they throwing different than us? Maybe they'll come in and catch them. Cause I never mm. picked up anything besides a two ball day. Um, I, I threw a hair jig, I threw a net rig, uh, threw the kitchen sink at them, but they just, the only thing I got bites on was a tube. I couldn't even buy a bite on a three and a half inch tube. I bumped down to the 2.7 inch. I caught two on the black river rock and I caught two on, a. Um, oh shoot, where's it at? It's the Northland Impulse Tube and a two and three quarter inch. And it was the color I was throwing is green pumpkin copper. Okay. Of course, I'm out of them now, but that tells you anything. Uh, with, with your partner, um, did you guys, what is your strategy with a partner? Do you like to have both people do a bottom bump? Do you like to have one hit one side of the water column, somebody hit something else? Do you guys both fish out of the front of the boat? Like, what, what is the strategy you guys like to do? So he's got an 18 foot, or yeah, 18 foot nitro. I think it's what the Z7. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this deck, I mean, his beam width is like 90 some inches. So we both stand on the front. Um, with the Tarova, it's really nice because he has spot lock and he's got the constant on and all this. It's, it has all the features of the Altrex just in the, the like the model down. So it's it's awesome. Like, could, could you believe there was a time that we didn't have spot lock like cavemen? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but. Uh, I mean, that makes it really, really nice when the water's ripping. You don't have to stand on the trolling motor all day. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got the, the Tarova has two buttons on the back of the pedal to where you can correct left or right. So once you hit constant on, you don't even have to use the pedal. You just bump it out together, which is amazing. So mm -hmm. we both, uh, usually our, our goal is like anywhere else and, and conditions dictate. So we knew it was 41 degrees on a warming trend after snow and all that other stuff. And it's been cold all winter. We knew it was going to be a long, slow day, but usually, like, if, if we know it's like that, I'll throw a tube, he'll throw a Ned rig or vice versa, or he'll throw a micro jig, and I'll throw something else. We, we try to keep it different until we realize, like, all right, the guy with the tubes catching way more fish than the guy with the Ned rig, and then we'll both swap over. And then, granted, color might be different, but we'll eventually, like, once we kind of dial it in, because we didn't pre-fish, that was the day, I, or the tournament I had all my boat troubles. Oh my goodness. Yeah, t tell, uh, if you're, if you want to tell everybody like, cause this is the thing I love about talking to people about tournaments is the mental side going in and going out, especially if it's a multi-day tournament, like, cause you, you go through such an emotional roller coaster. Tell people just the day before that week, like what was going on? Cause it makes this tournament win so much more awesome. I think. Yeah. So that Monday, I think it was, uh, whatever the last holiday was president's day or whatever. Yeah. Out to the river at like daylight. I was the uh, first boat there. I get out, I get everything unhooked from the trailer. I go to hit my trim switch on my motor to trim it up. 
and it's just clicking. There's no electric going to that whatsoever. And I was like, oh, geez, here we go. So I was like, this battery's fried. I'm not wasting this whole day. I went to Napa Auto Parts. I got a brand new cranking battery. I put it in the parking lot. I had to borrow a wrench from them because I took zero tools with me. I get back to the boat ramp. The trim's working. Everything's fine. I launch the boat, get it off the trailer, get in it, turn the key. It fires up. And I'm like, great. But my boat is a 99 two-stroke. It's cold nature. So, of course, it sputters and stops. Mm. I go to turn the key again. There's nothing. I'm like, oh, boy. Mm. So I was like, all right, well, if it's dead, I'm just going to troll motor over to the other side of the river and just fish up the bank. Cause there's, there's deep water and there's like rock, like cliffs and stuff. And actually right across from the boat ramps, always been a pretty decent spot. So I was like, all right, that, you know, I'll just go over here and fish that. And we'll see if there's anything on the troll motor's not working. I got to drop it in the water and the button is literally dead. Like I pushed the button and it didn't click. And I was like, Oh God. And then I went to turn the constant on, on, and it would like spin and stop, spin and stop. And then all of a sudden it just took off. And when it did, this plume of smoke came out from underneath the head of the troll motor. And I just felt burnt wires and it was disgusting. So I was like, all right, that's done. So here I am paddling an 18 <laughs> boat back to the boat ramp while my truck is still running parked on the ramp. And I was like, all right, I'm going home. So I loaded it up, got home, yanked the troll motor off of it, hooked the cranking battery up and it was charging. And I figured it had just sat on the shelf for so long. Like, it had one one shot at starting and that was it. But so I get it home, I get the troll motor taken off, I take the head of it off, and all the wires are like melted together. Oh my god. And I was like, it <laughs> I throw it like out the door of the garage. I'm like, I'm tired of this. And I actually called Jenny and I was like, uh, hey, can you order me a troll motor? <laughs> and I just got it put on uh like last week. So I mean, we're back to normal. And as I was going through the boat the jumper wire between the batteries was melted. I've never seen that happen. I don't know if it's sent. I don't know what happened. It just everything, every wire on that trolling motor or in the series was just melted. Mm -hmm. So I put a new trolling motor, a new plug in because I got the, uh, the receptacle or whatever on the front that you can plug the whole nine, which was another fiasco because that boat originally came in the nineties with a 12 or 24 volt trolling motor. because it was a four prong plug. Oh my God. When I pulled that plug out, I only had two wires on the new one. And I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> so I traced them all the way to the back of the boat. I'm like, all right, well, I got a solid positive, a solid negative, And I got two with a green stripe going around them. And uh, my uncle was actually a master electrician. So I had him there just to supervise. And I was like, right. Please don't let me do anything wrong. <laughs> and, uh, he was like, cut those two with a green stripe. I was like, are you sure? It, we were playing bomb diffuser, basically. He's like, yeah, cut the green one. So I cut both of them off with the new plug in, splice the jumper wire, and everything's fine now. But, Dude, I mean, like just before the tournament, though, mentally, that would fry. Like, even if like, let's say, like, this you're not even gonna use your that your boat in the tournament. You was already set to use yeah. your friend's boat. Still mentally, like to have all that shit go down the week of the tournament. Oh man, four days or what five days before? Yeah. yeah. Up punch. I didn't. <laughs> not only like, am I thinking like, damn, I missed out on a day of pre fishing. In my head, I'm like, damn, I gotta spend money to fix this now. And am I gonna be down for the first couple tournaments? And what's gonna happen? But everything turned out okay. So I mean, we're 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 getting back to normal now. But going but, into it, like, I mean, that's the other thing, guys. Too, it's like it's just the biggest part of the tournament fishing is, is like the mental side of it and getting that cool head. And the, th the thought that you had all this in the back of your head, plus you didn't get to fish for better or worse. Like when you're going in cold like that and at first tournament of the year, like you got all that stuff in your head spinning and then you go out there. So then did you basically just rely on, on kind of your buddy about going to these spots or these spots? Or are you fishing history, I guess, or are you just yeah. like going out there and winging it? Uh, it was a little bit of both. Like we knew the fish were there. They're always there. I mean, he's probably fished that part of the river a couple hundred times. I fished it enough to know that that's where we are going. Like as soon as we launched, we're going there. Um, but I kind of approach it like I approach anything else in life. Expect the worst and anything good that happens is a positive. So I just kind of yeah. went, went fishing. I mean, I expected nothing. And in return, I mean, we, we won, so that, that was the best possible outcome. But I didn't expect to do anything. I just so, 
Yeah. Like, so at one o'clock, like when you had your 13 pounds and you, you mentioned this earlier that you thought you had a pretty good bag. Did, did you guys think that you had, when did you think you had it actually? Uh, <laughs> it's a weigh in. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was worried all day because it, it took like 16 to win last year. And the year before that, it took like 14 couple to win. And then there's been tournaments up there where it's taken 18 pounds to win. Okay. But with the conditions and then like, once I got back to the, I was going back to get the truck to take the boat out and uh, the tournament director was there and I was like, uh, anybody got 20 yet? Just messing with him. He was like, we got about half that. And I was like, all right, good. Cause we were like one of the later boats to weigh in and um, sitting there, got the fish in the bag, went all over, weighed them. They were like 13, eight. Our big one was like three, eight. And we're like, all right, cool. You know, we don't have the bunker, but you know, we're at that point, four pounds ahead of everyone else that's weighed in. And then there's another guy that I mean, he's like, if he shows up, you know, he's got fish. Like he always finds them somehow, some way he always catches fish. And, uh, he pulled the first one out of the bag and it was like probably three quarters of a pound smaller than our smallest one. And I was like, all right, cool. And then he pulled out three more that were over three pounds. And I was like, Oh God. <laughs> so, and then when he pulled out the fourth one and waited, I was like, all right. And I'm, I'm waiting. Like the anticipation's kind of killing me at this point. He never pulled out a fifth one. So when he only had four, right then and there, I was like, yep, we got it in the bag. And then there was like two people weighing after him. And I think one guy had one that was like almost five. Cause that was the same thing when he pulled the five out of the live well, I'm like, Oh God, where's the red? And that's all he had. So there's and, nothing like being in that hot seat on stage or whatever. And you it's are the so worst. Awkward. It's the worst. <laughs> dude no it's not it's 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 awesome too in its own right like uh, we've all been on stage before and uh, i think the best thing is to always weigh in last versus if if you get to be in the hot seat early and then it's like jesus you're oh, just sitting there you know you know me in my offices so i always gotta be different i like weighing in first i don't care i'll set uh, the no i can't do that dude that is a gut punch i'm telling you anxiety just roll but I would rather be waterboarded than have to be like number one. And especially like if it's a big check, like, I don't know how those guys do it. If you're going for a hundred thousand dollars and you sit up on that damn stage for two hours, <laughs> it's just like, ah, oh, I couldn't deal yeah, with that. Waiting for somebody to drop a bigger bag on the stage. But now nah, honestly, I like, if I know I have a lot of weight, I, I'll weigh in first. Cause then you, I don't know. You, you can see the rest of everybody else just kind of deflate a little bit. It's the mental game. Yeah, my my pre tournament ritual is just to get in everybody's head before it starts. Like it'll be, what is it calling for? Saturday or tomorrow? Like thirty some degrees in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'll go to pay with no shoes on or something just to mess with people. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something stupid. Just this, okay, this guy's insane. Yeah, who is this hillbilly from West Virginia? But so then, oh my god. That's another thing. Like, I love terrible weather on tournament day. Like, it's calling for rain tomorrow. It's going to be chilly. It's a little wind. I know the water down there is muddy. And when people that just kind of wing it like I do and just show up, everybody gets in their head before it starts. They see these mm -hmm. terrible conditions and they're like, oh, my God, it's going to be a horrible day. We're not going to catch anything. It's going to be awful. And then here comes some hick with no shoes on, <laughs> paying the way in, just loving life. They're like, all right, <laughs> who's this guy? Yeah, I was always told it's like the guy you fear is not just the guy that's chill, but the guy that only has like one rod on his deck, no matter oh. what the conditions are. Cause you like, you know, he's either absolutely insane or he's got him dialed. <laughs> True story. That's a, that's a guy in our club right now. We went to our banquet a couple Saturdays ago for like the, the pre tournament banquet get together. And uh, the two guys that won the most trophies were both like either 80 or over 80 years old. And that's them. They have one rod on the deck and they just crushed everybody last year. There's something to that. There really is. Um, and it kind of like that kind of segues into like how many boats were in this tournament and what's the pressure like on a place like Dam five or Dam four that it's bait. It's really small. It's tiny, especially Dam five, even is smaller than Dam four. I mean, you have maybe a couple mile run upstream and you have maybe a one mile run downstream. So there was only 18 boats granted. It was a small tournament, um, but 18 boats on that body of water is a ton. Mm hmm especially when you know there's only like four or five spots that are going to pan out and i mean there was one guy that ran almost 50 miles to the south branch like he had a rock roof for uh one of those like rock roof style boats yeah he took 30 extra gallons of fuel and ran forever and sure. called nine, uh, nine pounds which wow. 
that's like the, you know, that's a make it or break it. You're either going to go up there and catch 20 or you're going to go up there and not catch a check. So you're taking a gamble. But anything over 15 boats on that stretch is you're kind of getting crowded and you're kind of like you worry about it because you're like, all right, well, depending on where we launch from, because I think we launched like 12th or 14th out of 18 boats. Yeah. And that's what I want to get into because you can use your big motor. And I feel like we, we had, um, um, we, we had Mar Marty Lawson on who's down in Fredericksburg and he talks about all the lakes down there are electric only because of that. I feel like it's almost like Aquaquan reservoir where like it makes it fish bigger because you can't just blast generally speaking to one to the other. So it doesn't get necessarily the pressure, but a place like this where you can use whatever horsepower you want does. And I guess to my point is if you know, there's like four good spots and people are on that, do the fish reposition or is it basically, if you don't get to one of those four hot spots, you're screwed. Or can you still guts and nut something together because the fish move around? If you don't get to those spots up there, you're kind of SOL. Like, my best friend, other than the other best friend that I was fishing with, mm -hmm. was fishing 300 yards behind us. They caught one fish all day. That's crazy. And it's literally, like, the boat behind us. We had a guy that actually kind of, he was he was getting on our nerves a bit. And, like, granted, I get it. We're fishing for money. But you're 50 mm -hmm. yards away from us, dude. Like, And you're, like, coming closer. At one point, he was, like, 20, 30 yards away from the back of our boat. So like he just kept encroaching and encroaching and encroaching and because there was like a log in the water and that was like our starting point and we'd fish up to where it, like the bend stopped and back and it was like 50 yards of water that was it and then by the like almost the end of the day he was like at our starting point which you've seen us sit here for seven hours mm -hmm. and you've seen us catch fish and he never weighed a fish in and that was just literally like a 30 yard difference of him not catching anything and us catching a lemon and that's kind of why we kind of started playing defense because we knew as soon as we left, that guy wanted that spot and there's still fish there. But, and that's crazy that you were able to get to that spot because you said you were one of the later later boats to launch off, right? I don't know why everybody ran elsewhere. There was a boat sitting there when we got there and they just left. And we were like, mm -hmm. all right, cool. <laughs> Here we go. Do you think it sets up where you have only so many good hot spots there because it's a river, not a lake? Like if it acted more like a true lake, with less current, do you think it would push the, it would, it would distribute the fish a little bit more? Oh, big time. Cause um, especially like in the summer, it kind of does. Cause there's like some humps and stuff out on the main river there that they're right out in the middle and you can go out and catch fish off of them. And they kind of like when the water's low, they act like it's a lake, but interesting as the water rises and you know, they just kind of push to the bank and they're in those like couple spots and that's it. So what made you guys not like try to throw like the classic like crankbaits and stuff? Was it just the conditions that dictated that you had to get finesse or because of the pressure? I there was so much sediment and debris on top of the water. I tried to throw a crankbait. Uh I get it to not like catch a leaf or catch a twig or catch whatever was floating down the river at the time. Cause honestly, at the one point, like we caught all these fish in 41 degree water out of one to three feet. They were on the bank because wow. of how the water was they just had to get out of the current and there was like a debris line on the bank of just like random stuff like twigs leaves all that good garbage just laying along the bank and the fish were almost laying underneath of it so we were like flipping literally flipping tubes with spinning rods at this stuff making like 20 foot casts mm. but, so how do you like with was it, and you said the water was off colored like really kind of get into the tackle setup then like wh what were you using and like because i would think you'd go with like a hot chartreuse or pink thing when it's that dirty or a lot of people at home would probably think that as well but you kind of went it seemed like with very neutral colors yeah i mean it was it was dirty it was like really dirty for what i like um but i just threw i don't know the the classics in dirty water a straight black tube two and three quarter inch Oh, and wow. I started trimming it because river rock leaves the tails long and I like a short tail on a tube with a fatter body. So I started trimming about a quarter to a half inch off the tail and I was just throwing it on this jig head. It's a Rogers, uh, three eighths ounce, two odd sickle hook with a little wire weed guard on it on eight pound fluorocarbon, Seaguar and Vizax, uh, 10 pound, um, two power pro power pro super slick. I have my 77 Phoenix Maxim spinning rod and I was throwing it on a 2500 size Daiwa 
Actually, Regal LT, I think. Wow, you're throwing a Daiwa? Oh, yeah. Big Daiwa guy over here. But yeah, this is this is a setup. I don't know if you can read it or see it, but it's a it's a seven seven spinner rod, so super super long. And I actually swapped the reels around. It's got a freaking lose on it now. It's the only reels blue uh, or lose reel I own. But yeah, I, I kept it in my hand all day. I literally bought it that Friday at Jake's, and then because I knew what I wanted to do with it, and I knew it, it was perfect for it. Because with that length of rod, as fast as that water was moving. You have to throw a heavy tube, but as you know, in rivers and stuff, tube heads like to bury in the rocks and stuff, so you're going to get mm -hmm. hung up a lot. But with that longer rod, I could keep the rod tip high, and it would make the tube almost set instead of in the down position. With the high rod tip, it would keep that jig head up, so the back of the jig head was like hitting the rocks, and it just makes it easier for it to roll over. Granted, could I have done it with a shorter rod? Yes, but that just made it so much easier. Because with almost eight foot of spinning rod, once I make the cast, I can pick my slack up quick with a 2,500 size reel and I can keep that rod tip high and no action on it, dead sticking all day long. Like literally just let it hit a rock, come over the rock and just hold it there and hit another rock, come over it. And then you would feel that like tick and just reel out and set the hook. Why a tube versus, I mean, the thing that every every smallmouth angler on the planet throws right now, the Ned Rig or the Drop Shot or a jig. Why is it the tube on the river, the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac, peanut butter and jelly? Because you don't see pros usually fish that as much anymore. Ah, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Maybe it's because everybody has hopped on this uh, Ned Rig train that they just don't see it as much. But it's been a staple since the 70s and 80s, especially on the Shenandoah and Potomac. Uh, the one memorial tournament that we fish every year in the summer for Butch Ward, uh, they called him Mr. Smallmouth. I mean, you could, if you go uh, Google Butch Ward, uh, a, a really, really nice article about him pops up. And it's the same two things that everybody else like in the winter here, hair jigs and tubes. That's all he talks about. Uh, maybe the subtleness, but I mean, you don't get more subtle than a net ring. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I, 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 have yet to figure it out because there's been days to where like i've swapped between a ned rig and a tube all day long and one hasn't out caught the other but i've caught more size on the tube or i've caught more size on the ned rig or there's been days where the ned rig's on and the tube's not so like i said earlier he was selling the ned rig uh just i think he was selling a green pumpkin trd and i was selling that black tube and i was getting bites and he wasn't and then he swaps over to a tube and he starts getting bites but it's it's just one of those things where I have both tied on at all times, mm -hmm. but whatever I'm starting to get the first bite on or what I get more bites on, I'll just stick with that. I, I don't have an answer for that. I have no idea. It no, it, it's just curious to me. Cause it's like how much of it, um, uh, like Jared from Jake's main tech told me the other day, it's like what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch the fisherman, not the fish with baits and products. And it's just weird that, yeah, like every time I've gone to the upper Potomac, whether I'm kayaking or throwing the boat out there, everyone's got a tube tied on. Mm -hmm. but but no one really has th these other baits that you see the pros fish and it's like is it because we know something they don't or is it just it's set in their ways that this is what you do that's when the you thing. go to these places they're they're set in their ways i mean you go up there now you'll you'll see a tube you might see a wacky worm you it, the basics like the the mm -hmm. bare bones of fishing is what i see a lot with other people or they'll, they'll learn a new technique that might be like a shaky head. So they're up on the river throwing like five, six and shaky head worms because they've seen it on a YouTube channel and they think it's going to work everywhere and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of success up there on Ned Rigs, but it's just for whatever reason, especially in the winter, that tube just does something different. I don't know if it's because the legs move when you don't have to do anything to it or the way I'm throwing it because I don't bounce a tube at all. I like, I, if I got a, if I'm throwing a tube, there's no movement on that rod other mm -hmm. than filling the slack up and lifting and dragging it. Cause I see a lot of guys, they want to bounce it. They want to reel the slack up and they want to give it a couple bounces and reel the slack up. I don't think a crawfish moves like that. <laughs> Cause if you've ever paid attention to them on the bottom, they're just kind of creeping along as slow as possible. And I'm just counting rocks. That's my favorite way to throw them up there. Yeah, my, my, my theory since we had uh, Travis from um, Kingfishers on is Mad Toms. 
that in this colder water period, it's those, those little mad Tom catfish. And if you ever like Google a picture of them, they're thicker bodied than a Ned rig. They're stubby and thick. And it's like, that makes sense why maybe a tube or a jig would work versus a Ned. Cause a, a Ned is a little sl more slender um, than a tube is. Let me grab some real quick. <laughs> And this is why we have him on, guys, because he always has the tackle everywhere. He sleeps in a tackle shop room. Basically. Hey, here's my uh, – this was my box that I was going to take to the Susquehanna this week. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's just packed full of all the good stuff. But I think a big thing, like, a lot of people could uh, – I don't know, to get more bites on a Ned Rig. Actually, my, my one friend kind of turned me on to this. A fatter Ned Rig gets more bites. Mm -hmm. Whether that's cutting down a six-inch Senko to the, like the fattest portion of it because that's that's way thicker than any Ned Rig bait you're going to find. And another one I found that I really, really like, and it's not just hype or hopping on the hype train, all these purple bags here, there's something to it. And I think it's more or less profile. Granted, the Maxent, if, it's that, if that's what they're eating, that's what they're eating. It's incredible. I just, I'm hard pressed to not take it anymore because of how well it works and power yeah. bait like that forever. Like I've always preferred a power bait worm over a, a zoom U tail worm. If I could throw the, the 10 inch power worm, I'm going to do it. There's something to scent. I, I, I believe in scent. Not everybody does, but I do. And it's what I have confidence in. But the big thing with the, uh, the max scent stuff, let me find an open pack. There we go. They're fatter worms. I mean, that's, Oh, that is stubby. Yeah, it's it's what two and three quarter. Yeah, two and three quarter inches, but it's super fat uh, compared to like here's a this is a four inch Z man worm, and this is like I don't know one point five times the girth of it. But I think so, do that stubbiness in a Ned rig, and I always thought it was BS, and I always thought my buddy was giving me a hard time. And but the more I started fishing the stubbier Ned worms, the the more fish I caught, the bigger fish I caught. And, so. Let me go grab my, my, my Ned rig thing. Keep, how, how do you rig your Ned rig? Keep telling everyone how you rig your Ned rigs on, right. on what your tackle is. I'll be right back. All right. So if I'm fishing a Ned rig, I got one favorite head that I like. Here's my, my little Ned box. Um, it's a two odd owner round ball, ultra finesse head. And I usually paint the head a brown or a green or a black. And I like to throw those in the river. Um, for whatever reason, the round ball doesn't get hung up as much. I can keep it weedless. I can throw it anywhere. So I'm not throwing that. I'll throw it on just a, that's a Rogers with a sickle hook, just a regular net head. If I'm not around big rocks and stuff. Um, but I got all kinds of different types. I got the ones with the wire weed guards. They all work pretty well the same, but my preference is this, especially with the fatter net rig baits, that wide gap, I get a better hook set with it. I also bought some of the Z-Man heads that are kind of similar. I don't like them as much because they're a number one hook. I like the little bit bigger, longer shank, thicker uh, thicker wire hook. Yeah. Here's the other thing I like to do with net heads, too, when I used to pour my own jigs, is I would make micro swing heads. Oh, wow. Yeah, swing wonder, heads. Yeah, a one or two odd hook because you can only find them in like six, five and six odd, it seems like. But the little one odds or number ones or number two hooks on a swing head is is awesome. I I love those. Um especially if you could figure out how to keep the elastic on there. Yeah. Cause like that's the thing that's a nightmare when you do now. Other I think other worm styles, like you said, like like the the Berkeley products are extremely good, but these here. This is the, the Nichols Lure like heavy cover net head, or I just got this. This is this is Japanese stuff right here. Uh -oh. This is the boss. This is a this is a football style heavy weed guard net head hook. This is a Japanese company that makes these things, and they can go up to a half ounce, but it still has a two odd hook on it and a thick weed guard. And let me get the company up here that makes them. But I've been using these, actually. I've been experimenting with these. Dude, 
it is so nice because you can take and you can use a, a Ned rig on a stout hook and a thick weed guard and you can jack them on 16, 17 pound test. Uh, Cause I don't know. That's the thing that I got really frustrated with when I fished the Ned rig, especially out of like a kayak or something. And you go with like the six pound, eight pound test and you either get hung up at the current and you break off constantly or you, or you stick a good one. And then you're like, shit, I got six, eight yeah. pound test. But yeah, you upgrade your tackle with a Ned rig. At least then you can lean on them and pop it out of the rocks a little bit better if you get snagged. That's, um, I was explaining this while you were gone. It's the uh, owner ultra finesse round ball. That's uh, it's one of my favorite, probably my favorite Ned rig head. Everything stays on it well, and it's like you said, I can throw it anywhere because it's it's Texas rig. Mm -hmm. So it's coming through whatever cover you want to throw it into, and. Uh, it just works, and it's a two-odd hook. So I mean, I could I've thrown it on 10, 12 pound tests before. I don't prefer to do that because I I like to stay like the traditional Ned rig style. I like to throw it on light line, eight, ten, whatever. Which is another reason that seven foot seven rod is so handy. Because if I am throwing six or eight pound tests, I have so much leverage in the rod. Grant, I set my drag pretty loose. So I mean, once I even if I do hook a good fish like that uh, five thirteen I caught last year up the river, I caught it on eight pound test. I just let the rod do the work. It loads. Mm -hmm. So whenever I stick a good one, I just let it run, carry on, do whatever it wants to do. And I don't have to worry about losing it. Yeah. 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 To me, it, it just, it, it depends if I'm dealing with like fast current or I feel like the bait's getting blown out. I like to go with that super heavy stuff because I know when it hits the bottom, if it doesn't hit the bottom, I know I have something. It just quickly gets down. And honestly, I just like being able to pitch and flip into the seams with, with a yeah. bait caster setup. And maybe that's just because I'm more comfortable with it. But I can take that same setup and I can use that for largemouth too on like the tidal Potomac, something like that. And I still got a little bit more meat to them. So I, I guess, yeah, because I, I do use it on the, yeah, spoilers, guys. I do use that on the tidal Potomac, not just the shaky head, but a power Ned rig that you can pitch and flip underneath the docks and stuff. Because, you know, with barnacles, like if you guys fish the upper bay, portion if you have tournaments there because there's so much barnacles and crap on the dock pilings you really if you can get away with it don't want six or seven because you can still hook you know a four or five pound largemouth and if you don't turn their head they're just gonna they're gonna cut that line on you so but no that that's that's some good stuff and then speaking of the title that i brought up you got a big tournament this weekend yeah uh tomorrow actually so i'll be up at about three o'clock in the morning rolling down the road so what are your thoughts on the winning weight uh 24 to 26 pounds. Oh, That's wow. A bag. All the March, April, May tournaments, if you don't have 20 pounds, you're not winning. You can have 18 and come in like fourth or fifth, but you're not winning unless you have over 20. So what now is this part of a, um, which tournament? Cause you fish like seven different organizations right now. Is this the, is this the same one as earlier in the year? Was that just a one-off? That was a one-off. Uh, that's more or less just a thrown together. Everybody has an agreement that's because that was the 34th anniversary of this tournament. So it's been around before I was a, a fault. Uh, this one's uh, the Potomac Team Series, and okay. you can go to their website. It'll pop right up. It's like PotomacTeams.com or something like that, and it has all their information. It's a uh, pretty nice series. It's ran extremely well. Like the guy is, he's a stickler for the rules, which I like because it keeps it fair across the board. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really good series. It'll probably have, I'm guessing 80 to hundred boats tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. And I, I think last year, like 180, some people fished in total, 180, some teams. So that's insane. Well, hopefully after you win this one, we can get you a brand new trolling motor. The brand <laughs> No, but yeah, dude, you're you're on your way. I think this is not just going to be the only win of the year. I think you're going to probably stick another one too. Um, yeah. Is there any sponsors you want to plug or anything like that? I have zero sponsors. I'm a hundred percent. I'm like Ricky Bobby. I'm sponsored by me. <laughs> it's been brought to you by me. My bank yeah. account. I mean, I do have a couple companies that uh, they're smaller that I've kind of had a, I don't know, I guess like an appreciation and an affliction for because. They've always treated me well. Uh, one company is a combat veteran owned company called Combat Jigs. He makes awesome stuff. Combat Jigs. A little bit higher. There you go. Perfect. There he is. There it is. Um, combat yeah, CombatJigs.com is his website. He makes some awesome stuff. Um, he, I think, is located in Oklahoma now. 
and he actually just started firing up making baits again but like here's one of his little crawl baits oh wow you want to talk about an awesome finesse jig trailer or a ned rig it's uh i think it's like 2.2 inches long but it's fat like we we're talking about it. dude that is nice stuff he's got some like awesome colors uh and if there's any trout guys out there he makes a bait called the hellfire and it's probably the best trout bait that's the best well-kept secret i have um he's a great dude and actually he sent me six of his like initial baits that he ever made and i tore the trout up on those things um he's got some other stuff too this one's called the tomahawk it's 3.3 inches and all of his molds are designed by him. He gets some CNC machine to what he wants. Like here's the little spade tail worm that he has. And it's, it's another awesome Ned rig bait, but he's a small company. It's only him making baits by himself. You know, his website's awesome. It's always, you know, he always keeps a pretty good stock of things. Um, and he's, he's a great guy. His name's Kyle, but uh, at combat jigs on Instagram, he makes great stuff. And then I guess the other company that I shameless plug, but Beast Coast. If you guys don't know about Beast Coast yet, that's that's the money right there. Dude, their that is ways, their jigs, everything they make is is my favorite. And here's their six point five inch swim bait. Okay, I don't think we need to talk about this, but like for your uh, for your weedless hooks, have you found a company that can make you a three eighths to a half ounce weighted belly hook? But it's not a like a twenty aught shark gaffing hook because like I don't know why that's a concept a lot of companies don't understand that we want to throw maybe a four or five inch swim bait but we don't need a a hook big enough to stick a bull shark. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me rifle through these hundred. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> um, you know I use the under beast hooks on anything that's meaty, but. Somebody just came. It might have been uh, what is the uh, the company Zappu Z A P P U. It's a Japanese company. Yeah. They came out with a, it's a, it's like an underspin style swim bait hook. So it's a belly weighted underspin style swim bait hook like this. Like this is the beast hook, but they make them in like one and two odd, and I think they go up to three sixteenths ounce. So if you wanted to throw a three point three inch contact on it, it's perfect. Yeah, that is actually perfect. Because, I mean, that, that's a part of the market that if they get into, like, I want a two, a one-odd to two-odd hook that can go up to a half ounce just yeah. so I can bottom, bottom bump those smaller baits. That's just like these. Like, the only reason I ever yeah. started making these is because this is a two-odd hook with a three-eighths ounce weight on it. You huh. can't find, I, I've searched Tackle Warehouse probably 10 times for these, and you can't find a swing head in anything, it seems like, in less than a five-odd. Mm-hmm. Like, making them for like biffle bugs and like the, the big creature style baits. But sometimes, you know, I, I don't know. I do a lot of smallmouth fishing. I don't want that big giant hook. Cause I can take something like this and the swing heads are awesome for coming through cover. So I can take something like a, this is a 10,000 fish Sakoshi bug. And I could Texas rig a freaking Ned rig bait on a swing head and throw it like they do the big ones. And mm -hmm. it's awesome, but nobody makes it. There's, there's like something in the market missing right now. And I was probably, you know, hit it on the head when I was making them. Just, I don't know. I got burnt out and I didn't want to do it anymore. Like, that's, in a, to me, innovative because every, it seems like everybody with that specifically has gone bigger and bigger and bigger. Nobody has scaled that down yet. I like to take that and throw it on, like, 10-pound test. Even, like, I'll, I like throwing contacts and stuff on this, too. Cause oh, yeah. It, um, you can roll it over. Um, I think uh, Chris Aldean was talking about that, throwing swim baits on swing heads. It's a great yeah. technique for smallmouth. Yeah, it is. And it's 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 great technique just for smallmouth, but if you have to take your swim bait and you want to bash it into stuff. Oh, it's perfect. Like, it, it's perfect. Especially like I know we you know we talked about before the broadcast. Like I love throwing like uh, American trash fish or or something like that. That that bait is specifically made to be fished like a Huddleston where it bumps into bottom and all the fins because it is so soft. You can catch maybe two or three on one before it's destroyed. It's so soft. Every time you hit something, it quivers. You have to bump bottom though to get that action. Like the American, like the little, like the, um, oh shit, the little sleeper, the dark sleeper. That's what it is. Something yeah. like that. But you have to have a specific type of weight to get it down on the bottom. And if, if you hit stuff, man, it just, uh, it they kill it. Absolutely kill it. Yeah. And that's like with the swing heads and the swim baits, like 
I'm fishing for smallmouth around shiners that are less than three inches long. I need something that gets down 20 feet, but I need a one odd hook. So mm -hmm. I these, and I mean, I even have one. It's like a number one. It's oh, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Shoot. Yeah, this is a number one extra wide gap, and it's a quarter ounce, and it's it's a swing. So I can put like the 2.8 inch Kotex on this, get it down, and not have to worry about getting hung up. Still have a good hookup ratio. And, they, and that's just missing in the market, in my opinion. Is it like a little niche thing that I like that maybe might not sell? Probably, but, and I get it from a marketing standpoint, you have to sell this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there's a big enough market that wants something like that. Because I, I would love to have that on like, uh, I don't know, even on like Lake Erie or the Great Lakes where you're fishing around gobies and you are fishing those giant flats for smallmouth. That like half to three eighths ounce of like a two odd hook on like a little goby colored swim bait, like I got like this. Mm. How awesome would that be? It's green pumpkin magic, which is like the, the most amazing smallmouth color ever. And a 2.8 inch contact around gobies and stuff. It's and funny. I, head, well, like what more could I ask for? Yeah. No, it, you're right. It, it's absolute freaking money. It is. It's absolutely money. Um, so yeah, I guess last thing for, before we, uh, for, before we end the recording here is like, what, what tips would you have for people that want to go out and fish the upper Potomac or Shenandoah river this time of year? Uh, three tips. It's, it's pretty on fire. So, I mean, you could go out and catch a good bag of fish right now. Um, I would power, I would start off power fishing, crankbait, jerkbait, spinnerbait. Um, see if I can find some fish. It's pretty pattern oriented. So if you find them in a certain depth of water, try to stay to that depth of water. Uh, Cause if you're catching them in 10 feet, they're in 10 feet. You can go fish the 20, you can go fish five feet. You won't find them like you did when you caught them in that 10 foot range. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd start out power fishing and I'd just tailor it after that. If the bite dies down, I would switch and throw like a tube, a net rig. Uh, you could probably catch them on a drop shot cause I'm sure the river is probably mid fifties right now. So they're pushing up to spawn. They're, they're getting there, especially for smallmouth. So if you can find a place that, I don't know, some sand, some rock, um, a place that looks like the, a smallmouth would want to spawn there, I would really beat that area pretty good. Um, rumor has it that there was a 6.8 pound smallmouth called a Dan four. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's more than a rumor. I, I know it's a fact, but yeah, they're there. You just got to find them. I mean, there's yeah, yeah. there. I've heard of two 20 pound bags come from up there in the last two weeks. So, Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's just, if they start taking better care of the river, do better stocking, uh, better introduction of bait and stuff, like it, it could definitely hold a bigger bag or, or oh, more consistent ones. Yeah. Instead of just the one random couple of weeks of the year where you go up and catch a giant bag of fish and then you catch five pounds and five fish the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the potential is there. They just got to put the effort in to make it what it needs to be. I, uh, I a hundred percent agree guys, but follow Chris, uh, follow him on Instagram. You don't have a Facebook yet. Do you? Uh, not for my fishing page. So he's going to have a Facebook and a YouTube page eventually, especially when he starts cranking his, a, a bunch of checks this year, but yeah, yeah, give him a follow guys. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.